Grant, thank you for joining me on the Spirit Farm Podcast. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. Happy to have you here, man. There's a lot to talk about. We have a mutual friend in common who introduced us. Yeah. I, I want to. We're going to get into the book and the online course and family, and we'll, we'll see where all this goes. But can we start with the company that you started, Stewardship? Yeah, happy to, man. Uh, so Stewardship is a place where you can get home loans, insurance, and investments from wise advisors who love you. And uh, that's kind of our our saying and what we like to say. And the purpose of why we exist is to love people through finances. So that's what stewardship is. And you're based out of Gilbert, Arizona. Yep, our office is in Gilbert, Arizona. And primarily we work with people all over the valley and all over the state of Arizona, correct? Yes. You primarily love Arizonians. Yes, primarily just loving Arizona. As an Arizona native, you know, I have an affinity <laughs> towards that. But yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, so t- talk a little bit about how that became, I mean, well, let's talk about all the things that you said because it's it's not normal to have one entity that does all those things. Yeah. I don't want to gloss past that. So mm-hmm. investments, mm-hmm. insurance, home loans. Home loans. Yeah. Uh how does that functionally work? You mm-hmm. have different departments or what are- Yeah, so functionally it's uh four separate entities um, that are licensed to do various those different things. products and services. Yep. Um, We are all under one roof, and we work together as a team to try to serve people as best as possible. Um, So that's how it functionally works. I'd say the why and the heart behind how it works has a lot to do with um, a little bit about my story and and going through college and becoming passionate about personal finances and understanding and seeing that God's Word had a lot to say about that as well. But essentially, it boils down to I really wanted um, to make sure that finances were not going to be an issue in, in people's life. Yeah. Uh, statistics tell us that money fights the number one cause of divorce. Yeah. Um, finances can dramatically impact relationships for the negative, but for the positive too. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to create a place where, where people could go, whether they knew it or not, that their relationships uh, would be awesome as a result of, of the money. Their money and their personal finances would enhance their life, not hurt it. So good. Yeah. So, so most people that are listening or watching— probably familiar with Dave Ramsey, right? Mm-hmm. Like he's the figurehead. He's mm-hmm. the he's he's a guy that's been at this. So how does if if that's a place of a point of comparison, mm-hmm. how is what you do different or similar mm-hmm. or offshoot or how do you think about it differently? Yeah, so uh, I'd say Dave Ramsey obviously one of the more influential um, people in finance especially in the evangelical world. He's an unbelievable marker, extremely intelligent and his program has helped a lot of people. Um, actually taught his program at various churches for many, many, many years. Oh, you did? Yeah, very much appreciate it. My company's actually what's called an endorsed local provider uh, for health insurance through his program. So mm. when people call into his radio show or go to his website and they need someone to help with health insurance, uh, he'll connect them with us. Mm. Um, if they're in Arizona. If they're in Arizona, correct, <laughs> yes. If we love Arizona. Arizonians. Oh, yeah, we love Arizonians. <laughs> um, but yeah, he— uh, so I appreciate so much of the stuff that he's done. Where we differ most, I'd say, is two things. Uh, one, we actually execute some of the things that are being talked about. He uh, educates more yeah. and communicates in that yeah. way. Whereas we have a lot of content where we educate and things too, but we also execute it too. Yeah. So we can get you the home loan you need to buy your home or refinance. We can manage your investments. We can create a financial plan. We can get your auto, home, and health, and life insurance for you. So that's uh, the main area where we're differ- different. Uh, the second thing is we um, are very, I don't know how to say this, with how, I love Dave Ramsey and I think he's great, <laughs> but um, we do, we try to intentionally be a little more humble, I'd say, huh. than he communicates. Yeah. Um, he draws a very hard yeah. line in the sand yeah. in some areas. Yeah. Um, and I understand exactly why. Yeah. Because he's speaking to the masses, right? He's speaking to the mes- masses. It's it's sexy. Mm-hmm. It draws attention. Yes. It's easier to be black and white and bold and right. cut up your car. Yeah, exactly. It plays better yeah. on video and podcasts. Yeah. And and to be honest with you, I really agree with about 70 to 80% of the stuff he says. I think it's great. Um, there is another kind of like 10% that I'm like, ah, I could argue differently. But then there's another 10 to 20% where I'm like, mm. <laughs> I don't know about that. We really believe that personal finances should be personal. Mm. There are some situations uh, where nuance is not only allowed, but it's way better Mm. for the person. And um, as a result, uh, that's another difference we have. 
uh, from, from Dave Ramsey. Can you give an example of someone that you've been working with recently where this situation was just unique? It was just different. And conventional wisdom might be X, but I'm telling them to go Y because mm-hmm. of their situation. Yeah, so one example that's common is uh, becoming mortgage-free, becoming debt-free. That is a huge deal. Yeah. And one of the most amazing things that you can celebrate. Um, it's a beautiful thing to, to be out of that bondage or servitude yeah. uh, with that debt. However, there's a difference between debt and leverage. And there are certain uh, debt instruments that can be used for leverage to really help your personal financial situation. Mm. An example, Caleb, just personally, yep. I still have a mortgage on my home yep. uh, because the interest rate on it is significantly lower yep. than the interest rate I'm receiving on my investments. Yep. So as an example, again, I have an investment account. The interest on it alone is paying my mortgage for me. Hmm. So why would I pay down or pay off my mortgage when I am becoming my own bank in that way? I am using yeah. leverage. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? And he, why, would, he would say, don't do that. Why would you take the money over here that's making you money exactly. to pay this off? Exactly. Yeah. Now, makes- now, the reason why some of the stuff that he does works is because it's very behavior-based. Um, finances are very behavior-based. If you have the right behaviors, it's going to help. Look, if you pay your mortgage off, early and you don't do leverage, it's not going to be lethal to your financial situation. That's why his advice works. Mm. Um, But understanding personal situations, trying to be even more efficient with things uh, can happen. And if you have a wise advisor who's walking alongside of you, it's easier to act on some of those behaviors. Sure, sure. What's something else that might, might be an unconventional way that you view money or business or the work that you do for your clients? Yeah, um, I think something that is maybe a little more unconventional than than society would see is we strongly believe that what we do and how we do it is worship. Mm -hmm. Uh, When we go to the office um, every day, I'm saying a prayer and I'm asking God to help me, to give me, uh, ask the Holy Spirit to intervene within me to to genuinely serve and put other people's needs ahead of my own. Um, and I believe that if I do that with everything I've got, my heart and my head is in the right place, I can walk down the stairs at the end of the day um, praising God, yeah. saying, man, that was for you, Lord. Yeah, even if the markets took a dive, yeah. even if this didn't work out, yeah. it's, hey, you know what, I, I, I did the very best with what yes. I had today Yes. in a way that was trying to honor. Yeah, and you know what, Caleb, it's, it's interesting. It, it's more than just saying that despite the circumstances, that mindset of genuinely worshiping God with what we have, yeah. uh, it gives us confidence to take mm. these really unique actions. Mm. Um, some people might say like, oh, Grant, starting a mortgage company, an insurance agency, financial planning, investment, that's pretty ambitious. Like, what, what did you do? How did you get to take those actions? And yeah. really, I get the confidence to take those actions because of that worship mindset with huh. work. Um, I know that as long as I'm doing it with my head and heart in the right place, as said before, um, I can act with confidence. And that confidence allows a lot of this stuff to happen. I think too often, sometimes you can get uh, paralyzed yeah. uh, with fear. That, sure. Oh, man, these things that, that I'm doing, is it really going to work out? Or well, what if this goes bad? Like you said, the market's turning. One, well, I can't control some right. of that stuff. You know? Plus, we're plagued, most of us, mm-hmm. with worry about what other people think of us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And am I successful enough? Am mm-hmm. I making enough money? Well, what if this fails? Is it going to be embarrassing? Yeah. And uh, you started this thing from, from scratch. Mm-hmm. And you've done it in a way that's pretty impressive, getting mm-hmm. all these different components lined up under one umbrella. Mm-hmm. How did you decide to do that? How did you know that you wanted to do that? Did it come together over time? Mm -hmm. Can you take us back to like the decision, Mm -hmm. the determination, and then kind of how it played out? Yeah, yeah, grateful for your encouragement. You know, when I went to college, I uh, went there because I wanted to learn more about God's Word. And uh, I thought I wanted to be a youth pastor because my youth pastor was really cool. And I wanted Mm. to be cool like him, right? (laughs) Uh, And when you go to a small Christian college, uh, there are many churches that are kind of leeching on to as many yeah, kids as yeah, they can. Yeah, give us some volunteers. Exactly. Volunteer work. So I did that. And although I really enjoyed uh, serving youth and, and and being involved in that, I didn't really like how the hot dogs were made. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I just, you saw behind the curtain. Yeah. I, the, the Wizard of Oz was looked a little different than I thought, you know? <laughs> and I was like, man, I don't know if I want to do this the rest of my life. I just want to hang out with kids. I don't want to do the other stuff behind yeah. the scenes at the church. Yeah. 
So uh, as that was going on, I was in the midst of um, really diving into God's word on my own for really the first time in my life. Although I grew up in the church, uh, I never really read God's word on my own. And uh, as I was going through that, I just saw over and over again how often he was talking about money. And I started studying him. Like, as much as anything else in scripture. Yeah, it's more than heaven or hell. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. why? What in the heck? Why is this in here? Yeah. I started questioning that. And then I'm like, oh, that's right. He's smart and he loves us, <laughs> you know? And uh, he's going to do his best to, to love us with, with some wisdom here. Yeah. yeah. So as this was happening, I was also employed by a mortgage company. And what I was seeing was a lot of, of salespeople putting um, people in our community in mortgage products mm. uh, that weren't best for them. And the reason why they were doing it is because uh, they knew that it would net them a few extra dollars of commission. Yeah, close the deal. Let's exactly. just get it done. Yeah. This is circa like 2005. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yep. so I'm like watching all this go down. And then what would happen is months or a couple of years later, you would notice that same family who came in would then have to come in and refinance because they were deep in debt again. They couldn't make their payments or there was like a divorce or something happening. Yeah. Um, or they had like a three or five year arm and now it was like, oh, how do we convert? Yeah. There were a lot of those being sold, it seemed like. Exactly. So rather than genuinely understanding what the needs were of that person, serving them, put their needs ahead of their own for the commission, I was just like, man, this, this is why money's so important. Mm. I'm literally watching, Caleb, these families, these relationships being torn apart. And as I was diving into God's word, I'm like, okay, that's it. I'm, you know, I'm not, I don't want this anymore. And in my kind of arrogance and pride, I thought I could fix it. And mm. I thought I could be a resource that would change the world in that regard. And um, But I don't know if that's arrogance or pride. You mm. are. I mean, if who knows where it goes from here, but you're mm. you're literally fixing it for the people that, you are able to serve, yeah, and and motivation being, hey, I'm not sure that I want to do the mm-hmm. traditional church in a box thing, mm-hmm. but I'm gonna I'm gonna serve humans mm-hmm. through this mechanism, which is true and useful, mm-hmm. and that clearly God really cares about. Yeah. Um, so just wanted to say, yeah, that. well, I don't thank think, you. I th- I think you're not you're selling yourself short on that. Well, you know, I'm grateful for the wisdom in God's word and how it affirmed and gave me some of the confidence, like I said, to take some of those actions. Um, and even in college, that's when, you know, the, the planning for this was put together, you know, putting together the business plan of, of wanting to have not just a mortgage company, because I was familiar, because I was working in that. While you were in college, you yes. were at the mortgage company? Mm-hmm. So did, were you getting a business degree at the same time? Yeah. The, the, there was the Bible learning stuff, mm-hmm. but then there's also some practical business stuff. Yeah. Through which you're building essentially your business plan. Yeah, so oh, cool. the way the college worked is I was able to transition my major. Um, well, it was kind of different there, but I was able to just add more credits and double major. Mm-hmm. So I double majored in Christian ministries and business administration. Yeah. So through some of those business classes, you have to write you know, business plans for fake companies and different things. Sure. Well, I was able to do it for one that I really wanted to open yeah. someday. You know? yeah. And that was a lot of fun. Did you call it stewardship or did you have another name back then? I didn't have a name. I had no idea what I wanted to name yeah. it, but yeah. Batma. Yeah. Batma business. Yeah. When somebody, <laughs> uh, we jokingly referred to it as like God's love mortgage, you know, because it was just <laughs> kind of funny. But yeah, you know, we. Uh, but right I, from the onset, sorry to cut you off. Yeah. Right from the onset, it sounds like you had that vision and that passion to love people mm-hmm. through this business, mm-hmm. even as a 22 year old. Yeah. I think it genuinely came down to to putting other people's needs a- ahead of my own mm. because that's what Christ did for us. And mm. his great love really gives me no other response but to respond in love. Mm. So again, as I was reading God's word for the first time, I fell deeper and deeper in love with him and recognized and was able to experience more of that love. And mm. I-, I didn't really know how else to respond than, than to do that. Mm. Um, and yeah, I had the opportunity to to practice it in, in many different levels, including but not limited to in business while I was, you know, doing and closing mortgages um, for this other mortgage company. And, and so, being like, so what age or what year, when did you start it? Um, so what had happened uh, is I graduate and uh, get married and becoming more and more passionate about this, talking with my wife and friends about when I'm going to start this. And I, I'm about... Uh, you know, I think at the time, I don't know, I was 24, 25, something like that. And 
I present to my boss, who was a leader in the youth group that I, that I grew up in. Okay. And that's how I got the job through the mortgage company. Okay. Um, I said, hey, look, here's this business that I want to do. I want to structure it this way. I want to structure commissions and fees differently. I want to communicate things differently to, to the customers. And when I got done explaining it all, he's like, Grant, this is really good. Mm. This is awesome. But I can't do it. Mm. Because if I did, I wouldn't make enough, enough money. Mm. I'm like, hey, look, I totally get that. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to start my own company. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like, great. And, and he even supported me by showing me the resources and things that I needed to do to start a mortgage company like wow. he did. Wow. Um, so that's what I did while still employed there. Just a, a, a few months, maybe a year total after I'd graduated college. Wow. Um, I started in on, on having my own company. Do you feel like there's a certain type of person that should be an entrepreneur and other people that shouldn't? I think there's more and more people are trying to decide or wrestle with, should I start my own thing, mm. it seems. And uh, from your experience, the people that you've coached, you've got, you've got great people that work for you and with you mm. uh, versus someone who should spin out on their own. How, how would you characterize what it takes to be someone who starts something from nothing? You know, I think it takes the right mindset. And more than just t- having the right mindset, but genuinely believing it. Uh, the heart of every business is serving. You are serving others through um, either a product of ser- or service of some type. Somebody somewhere is being positively impacted as a result of this. Mm. Uh, and that is extremely important. Mm. So um, if you have that mindset, uh, I think you can be an entrepreneur. But if you really believe in that mindset, that's going to lead to taking the actions to have a successful business. Mm. The, the, so person, you, you didn't even say anything about the great idea Mm-mm. or the savvy Mm-mm. or the experience yeah. or the pedigree. It's yeah. like commitment mm-hmm. to serving. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. And, and here's, here's, there's a lot of statistics out there about businesses that fail and fail within three years is yeah. kind of the number. Yeah. Um, and you can be really motivated by money. You can be really motivated by uh, the, the allure of success and all those things, and those can work, but it's not sustainable mm-hmm. at all. So if you get from the beginning, I'm going to make a genuine impact on other people. I'm going to serve people well with this thing and put their needs first. Um, it might grow a little slower, uh, but it's sustainable, yeah. and it'll work, yeah. and you'll succeed. Good for you, man. So now here you are, what, 10 years later? Uh, 13 years, yeah. 13 yeah. years later. Yeah. And how have you seen the trajectory? You, like you said, maybe it grew a little bit slower at first, mm-hmm. but what does it look like? Where, yeah. are you, where are you today? Well, when I started the mortgage company, the writing was on the wall that uh, the recession was coming. Yeah. The mortgage world was going to fall apart. And uh, my uncle, who uh, had worked in personal finance and was a mentor of mine, um, asked me to, to go to lunch. Typically, I was asking him for lunch and advice, but he had asked me, and it was the purpose of that meeting was, do you want to grab me by the collar and say, Grant, don't do this. Mm. This isn't wise. And his advice was sound uh, because months afterwards, the, the mortgage industry kind of collapsed. But despite all of that, every single year that we've existed, we've had the opportunity to love more people in their finances every time. And uh, the year prior. Yeah. Mm. Every, every year it, it grows. And I, it doesn't matter what the financial situation is, what what we've seen in the industry, whether it be an economic change or whether it be a regulatory change that has impacted us positively or negatively, we've been able to sustain through that. And I genuinely believe that's a testament of God's faithfulness for sure. Now, our mutual friend, Jean, who I've had on the podcast, Mm. such a good dude, he talked to us about his boating accident, the Mm. near-death experience, Mm -hmm. and how that gave him new perspective and passion for life. And Mm -hmm. He says that you are the most impressive leader mm. boss that he has ever been around. Yeah. And you're younger than him. So that's high praise. And I'm just interested to know why you think that that is. What, what, what's unique about you or how do you approach leading people? And why do you think that so many people are attracted to want to work with you? Man, that was, that's extremely encouraging. Um, just hearing that from you. Grateful that you would share that. Jean is somebody I look up too highly and I consider a mentor for sure. I'm, I'm grateful I get to just work with him every day. Mm. Man, why, why is it? Um, no, really, it's, it's continuing with this theme that we've already talked about. Um, something that I do my best to do. I don't do it every day well. I fail. I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. Uh, but when I'm winning with it, 
um, I'm genuinely, again, putting people's needs ahead of my own. If I can put myself in somebody's shoes and try to experience or understand what they're going through on a day-to-day basis, yeah. whether it be in the office or at home, take a genuine care and love for them and then act on that um, makes a big deal. Um, I want employment with me to enhance somebody's life. Yeah. I want their marriage. I want their parenting. I want every aspect of their life to be better mm. as a result of working with me. Mm. Um, now, I think that that's something that hopefully that people would say, but I think mm-hmm. you actually execute it. Like you, mm-hmm. you actually do that. Mm-hmm. And I've heard that that's the case. So mm-hmm. what are some practical ways that mm-hmm. you build that into a corporate environment Yeah. so that some of those touch points are real for people? For sure. Yeah. So again, our, our customer or our mission statement rather is to love people through finances, which sounds extremely vague. So it's like, how do you do that? Well, if I'm loving my team, and they can then say, oh, how do I love people to customers? I, I, I just do what Grant did to me, mm-hmm. right? And some practical things that, that we do is um, I do what's called um, an employer review. I don't believe in 90-day quarterly uh, performance reviews. I think that they're not wise. People are going to go into them with a mask on or with some defenses up. And you're very rarely going to get something great out of somebody in, in those meetings. Mm. Um, I also don't like what typical our performance reviews are put together. And that is, hey, look, we're going to create some goals for you. You know, Caleb, I know you're capable of this. I'm going to create a goal of this Mm. uh, that's higher than what you're capable of just so you reach for it, right? And that's just not sustainable. That hurts people. So I'm not into that. And this uh, employer review, I take people out to lunch. They get to pick wherever they want. We can have a lunch or a free meal. They get excited about that. But I'm going to ask them questions about, um, you know, them in their shoes. How are they feeling? Hmm. How does their family feel about their job? Um, how do you feel about me as your boss? What are things I could do to get better? What are things the company stewardship could do to meet our mission hmm. better? What tools and resources do you need? How, how are your tools and resources that you have right now? Is there any education or any uh, computers or any other things that I could provide for you? I just genuinely ask them questions and try and serve. Uh, people say that to be a leader, you have to be a visionary. And I think that's probably wise, but I'd say more than anything, you need to be a listener. You Mm. need to listen well, Mm. create opportunities, and ask questions where you stop and then have your notepad out like I'm ready to listen and act on the things that you said. And and that's one of many things I think that we do that anybody, any business, and any leader can do. I love it, dude. And I agree with you. I think that that vision comes out of observation, Mm. (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. Creativity comes out of observation. Yeah. And so paying attention, listening, being aware, asking mm-hmm. those questions. Yeah. Uh, I, I talk about vision as being like a, a trajectory. So I look back at what, what's God done in the past? What's my story? What's, what's happening right now? What does it seem like he's doing? All right, well, my guess is that this is probably the trajectory that we're on and this is where we're yes. going. And hold that loosely because things change. But, mm-hmm. but observation, listening, mm-hmm. plus you're just really – valuing those individuals. Totally. And time yeah. says that as much as anything else. Mm-hmm. Asking them, inviting them to speak critically, yeah. whatever, about is is courageous mm-hmm. and authentic. And then if they see you even put some stuff into practice that they mentioned, mm-hmm. uh, that becomes heroic. Yeah, and I think when you say valuing somebody, that's another thing that people can do. And there's a practical thing that we do incorrectly, I think, as leaders. Um, many times we expect somebody, because we've hired them, to behave. Like, I expect you to do your job and do it well because I'm paying you a wage, right? right? So we expect this behavior. And then if they behave well and they perform well, then we are going to let them know that they belong. And we're going to treat them extra special, mm-hmm. right? Well, I believe we need to flip that. On, mm-hmm. on day one or before they even come in, like when, when I interview people— um, I tell them, like, look, this might sound weird. You haven't accepted a job yet, but my wife and I, we love you. Hmm. And, and I say it again, that sounds really weird, but, but, but we love you. We believe that's a choice. You belong, and we're grateful for you. And, and I look them in their eye, and I say that with everything I've got hmm. um, because I want them to know that they belong. Yeah. Uh, and, and when they do feel that, that truth, um, that they, they belong, man, the behavior is crazy. Mm. It changes to an unbelievable way and helps the team perform at higher levels than they ever thought they could. 
I believe that. And mm-hmm. I believe that a sense of belonging is kind of like the primary way that we experience love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. what we're hungry for is yeah. to do, do I belong? Is this a place for me? Yeah. So can you give us an example? You don't have to name names or anything, yeah. but but of of a way that this has played out. Like mm-hmm. someone who you brought in and they felt that, they hadn't felt that before, mm-hmm. and they went from this level of performer to this level of oh, performer. Yeah. And just kind of what that looks like. Yeah. So uh, one of my employees uh, didn't have any experience in the mortgage industry. Um, he was actually somebody that uh, worked in a grocery store as a clerk. And um, that job paid a, a certain wage, but it also came with a certain kind of stigma or, or sense of belonging just in his own kind of immediate community, whether it be his family or his in-laws mm-hmm. or anything else. And um, when he came on board, uh, I was very, very intentional with trying to build his confidence to let him know that that he belonged. He was a part of this team. He was a part of this industry. And more importantly, he's a part of genuinely making an impact on the community. Mm-hmm. If a review came in, I would tie that review to, to him and how the work that he did made a positive impact on somebody's life. If he was doing a task as annoying as it was, I would show him that this little task that seemed mundane, it genuinely made an impact on somebody's life. It, it, it created for him almost this aspirational identity that he was living to. Um, and being very intentional with some of those things over time has now put him into, he's quite literally one of the top mortgage loan originators in the country. He's in the top 1% in the country. With the Are number. you kidding yeah. me? He's, he's amazing at his job. And, and that's because he really cares. Huh. He really wants to love people uh, through a mortgage process. And he attacks things and looks at things with so much vigor uh, because he cares. So good. Yeah. Now, you created an online course mm. about company culture. Yes. And how, when did you create that? Mm. And how have you gotten that out to the world? And mm. how are people engaging with it? Yeah. So, weird kind of thing happened. We had some success at stewardship. And as a result, people asked me to speak at different events and go to different things. And it was fun. And it was great. The next thing I know, I turn around and my personal assistant's like, Grant, we're having a hard time getting things done because you're traveling a lot and speaking at these different events. Yeah, um, We need to change some things up. And I'm like, man, I, I really appreciate sharing. and I want to keep helping people and giving them that, that impact. And I yeah. stumbled across this world of online courses, like yeah. this thing. Yeah, I'm like, I'll figure that out, right? <laughs> so I, I put together this online course that basically allowed me to go deeper into the things that I talked about at these events. Um, but also allows me to put in some of the resources. Like people can literally copy and paste the things that I do at Stewardship yeah. and put it in their business. Download and, the PDF exactly. and just take it as. Yep, yep. Was, was there a model that you used out there that when you were researching how to do an online course? Oh, totally. Yeah, so there, there is the online business queen, Amy Porterfield. Yeah. She is unbelievable, has an awesome podcast too. Yeah. I took her course. And walked through it, and next thing I know, I've got an online course like her, and it was it was wonderful. She's an amazing woman. Have you met her? Yes, very generous. Cool. Uh, she's she's great. So yeah, cool. anybody who's thinking about taking an online course, check out Amy Porterfield. Yeah, I haven't met her, but I've I've heard a little bit about what she does. And mm-hmm. It seems like she's very effective, and like mm-hmm. yourself, very genuine and coming mm-hmm. from the heart. Mm-hmm. And so that's great. That's good to know. So yeah. you you create this thing, you yeah. You, you, and then what happens? What, what do you do with it? How does it actually go out into the world? Yeah, a weird thing kind of happened. Um, so I kind of launched it to a couple of beta users, some other people I'd connected with. I mean, you speak at events and on the stage, you get connected on you know through social media or whatever. And one of the people that took the course actually worked for this publisher. Huh. And the publisher said, hey, you know, you could turn this into a book. And I'm like, ah, I never really wanted to be an author. And they continue talking to me like, no, no, you really should do it. Uh, And I'm like, all right, sure. And so I wrote a book on a very small portion of what was in the course. And then that book kind of got launched and published. And now that's kind of the main feeder for the course. So people find out about the course typically through the book or through following me on social media. And yeah, then they buy it. What's the name of the book? The name of the book is The Problem Isn't Their Paycheck. How to Attract Top Talent and Build a Company Culture That Can Thrive. The problem isn't, isn't their, their paycheck. Yep. Mm-hmm. So it's a book about company culture. Mm-hmm. It's a book about investing in your people. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have a publisher. Mm-hmm. How's are you? You're in. You mentioned you're in launch mode right now. Well, yeah. So the the book uh, officially launched about like a month ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so now we hear our 
we're here we are a month later and still working through like this whole process of it's like a virtual book tour among different yeah. podcasts and different yeah. things talking about it and a lot of fun. Now you're being humble. So the book launched really well. Mm. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, it hit uh, number one bestseller on Amazon in six different categories, um, which was a lot of fun. Didn't necessarily expect that, but it was really good feedback. What categories, by the way? Uh, business management, um, all kinds of different business categories okay. and leadership A variety categories. of business and mm-hmm. leadership categories. Yeah. That makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. So you have a publisher, but is it primarily being sold through Amazon? Correct. Mm-hmm. And then your your virtual tour, you're doing podcasts mm-hmm. all over the place. You just said that you were at Quicken. Yeah, in Detroit. Mm-hmm. That's fun. Yeah, yeah. And then so where, do, where does it go from? Now you're in the Spirit Farm podcast. Yeah. yeah. So when then where does it go from here? Uh, you know what? I don't I don't know exactly where it'll go from from here. I, I do know that my heart is to try and help and encourage as many people as possible. It's, um, and stewardship, I want to love people through finances, through culture course. I want to love people um, in their leadership and management. Yep. There's this statistic that, that Deloitte did in this exhaustive study. And um, they basically interviewed um, people from all kinds of different types of jobs and all kinds of different um, employers through all over the country. And it could be with a C-suite executive management position or a very part-time administrative position. And what they found is that almost 90% of employees are not giving their best at work. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is just plain wrong. Mm. It's just plain wrong to the business owner, to the manager, that people aren't giving their best. But it's also plain wrong to the employee. Remember earlier in the show, I mentioned that work is worship. Yeah. And if you're not giving your best, that's an opportunity yeah. that our society is missing yeah. in really making it worship. Because when we do work well and we are giving our best, it makes a positive impact on others, yeah. on other people in our society. Because yeah. business doesn't exist without genuinely serving other people. Yeah. So everybody whole, wins. Right. Everybody. Everybody wins. wins. You win. There's a sense of fulfillment. Yes. Of pride in your work. And yes. Your effort. Yes. It's honoring and glorifying to the God who made you and gave you the skills and the tools and the opportunities. Yes. It's honoring to your boss and coworkers, and it's mm-hmm. honoring to the people that you're serving. Everybody wins. You got it. So that stat, man, it's just, like I said, it's just plain wrong. And my hope is, where does this go from here? My hope is we turn it around. You move the needle on that. Yeah. Yeah. That's the hope. Yeah. And, I mean, you're in your 30s still, so mm-hmm. you got pretty good runway to, <laughs> to make a dent and an impact mm-hmm. on that, not only in Arizona, but now with an online course and a book mm-hmm. and all the things that you're doing and speaking, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of other places. Mm-hmm. Do you have, other, other than that big dream of moving the needle on that, mm-hmm. are there some other shorter-term goals or mm-hmm. hopes or visions or next steps for stewardship? Yeah, for sure. Um, with the financial planning and investment management, we are currently able to serve customers outside of Arizona. There you go. Yeah, and our goal is to become a national brand at some point. Okay. Uh, we don't want to put a limit or a ceiling on uh, the number of people that we can love through finances. We want to make as big of an impact um, as the Lord would allow us. We want to make as big of an impact as possible. Mm. And uh, that is including, but not limited to, uh, serving people outside of the state of Arizona. Yeah. So, yeah. So with all the stuff that you got going, uh, we've got, you're an author, you speak, you're very well-spoken, you're leading this team, you're executing on some aspects of the business, obviously. Uh, How do you stay healthy? Mm. How do you keep control of your schedule, your calendar, your health? Mm. And then your family, you got three kids. Mm -hmm. What, what, What are some decisions that you make to protect yourself, to protect your health, and even maybe giving us like a, a week in the life of Grant yeah. Bauman. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it takes a team. It's a team of people. Uh, stewardship does not have the success it has, does not have um, the impact that it has without the team of people that are there. Mm. Um, I am so grateful and fortunate that I've got a team of self-directed employees that are on this mission. We're unified by this purpose uh, to love people through finances, and they go at it with everything they've got every day. Mm. Um, so that is a big, big deal. I don't have to babysit anybody. I don't have to micromanage anybody, which frees up a crazy amount of time because I can and I do trust them to act uh, on this mission. So that team is huge. Uh, My wife is unbelievable. Uh, She keeps me grounded. She keeps me humble. She helps make sure that uh, my head doesn't get too big and and can can help me in that regard. Uh, But she makes sure I'm doing the things I need to be doing. Um, I have a personal assistant. Her name's Brianne. She's unbelievable. She's amazing. 
And my kids and my wife, they're on this mission with me. Mm. Um, I genuinely believe that the mission that I have in my business, it comes from the mission that my wife and I have in our marriage and, and the mission that we have um, as a family. And what we say to our kids is, hey, what is life about? And they respond with others. Mm. And then we say, what do we do with others? And they respond with love. Mm. Uh, our family exists to love others. And um, that's why with the business, we love people through finances. So, yeah, uh, what is a life? Dude, give, us, like? give us a day in the life, a week in the life. Yeah. How do you build your rhythms? When, yeah. When do you wake up? What do you do to stay fit? Yeah, I'm a huge fan of uh, Michael Hyatt, and he teaches yeah. uh, the ideal week. And in my ideal week, um, I'm making sure that I am staying fit, and I work out at least two to three days a week. Um, I make sure that I get a date. What do those workouts look like? I am an Orange Theory guy. So You're I work out with all the, all the soccer moms running on the <laughs> treadmill, having a good time in Gilbert. Just get that heart rate yeah. where it should be. Yeah. yeah. You know, the thing is, um, I try to remove as many barriers to some of the hard disciplines in life. Sure. Um, one of them is working out. And uh, Orange Theory is in the same parking lot of the stewardship parking lot. There you go. So I have zero excuses. They've got a shower there and everything. All I've got to do is show up. That's it. I don't have to think about how to work out. I just show up and do what they say, shower, and I'm done. Remove the barriers. Yes. Yeah, and then, yeah, exactly. You don't have to think it through. Mm -hmm. It's like Steve Jobs just wearing the same thing every yeah. day. You just show up. Yeah. Okay, tell me what to do. Yep. I tied my shoes. Yeah, that's exactly it, too. Like, right. I'm— uh, this is a different colored shirt that I normally wear uh, because it's beautiful cyclorama and, and showing up pretty for your show. But normally I just wear a gray t-shirt every day. Yeah. Um, and I, do, I, I pull the Steve Jobs. I have the same t-shirt, same jeans, and just wear the same thing. I try to limit the number of barriers I have in my life. I love it. So I'm on execute. that path too. Yeah. I, I'm gradually moving there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've been slowly moving there over the last few years. Now yeah. I'm at the place where I wear Either black on black or blue mm. on blue. There you go. And eventually, when I find the perfect thing, then mm -hmm. I'll just buy 50 of them and just do yep. that all the time. But yep. Yeah. So I respect that's a, it. I, I'm, I'm into that too, man. It, it's just trying to find as many of those disciplines that you know you need to do and, and, and removing the barriers. Um, I got date night once a week, date night with my wife. Again, removing barriers. Our kids are getting to the age where they can kind of stay home on their own. And a typical date night for us is just walking around the lakes in our neighborhood and having a good conversation cool. while they're home alone. And Next to no barriers. I don't have to think about where we're going to eat or even spending money. It's just one-on-one -on -one time with her. That's so good. Um, especially with my kids, too. Um, I'm a huge uh, coffee snob. So uh, I go to a coffee shop with my kids. They get a pastry and a hot cocoa. I drink coffee, coffee I like. Uh, and do you make coffee at home most mornings or do you go out for it every day? You know, I can't make the coffee as good as I want it. So yeah. I typically am going somewhere else for it. Yeah. I let the pros uh, do their thing. I try to stay in my lane. Um, <laughs> but yeah, date night with kids once a week means going to get some great coffee, which I get excited about. But cool. then I also get great connected time with my kids as well. All three at once or one at a time? One at a time. One at a time. Yep. So every week they switch. Yep. Cool. Yeah. And then we also uh, try to do what we call one kid up once a week, where we put two of the kids to bed and allow one of them to stay up, which is mom and dad. Huh. Uh, and that's time where we can connect with them, where we can talk to them about like really serious stuff, whether it be talking about sex or pornography or what's going on in their life. Or we don't have anything that we really want to talk about with them. We just, you know, play Legos or video games with them or watch Frozen. Exactly. You know, <laughs> watch a YouTube video or something. Uh, we'll watch Spirit Farm podcast. Yeah. So, you know, that's something that uh, we, we try to do on a week basis as well. Uh, as part of Michael Hyatt's kind of thing that he he teaches, he's all about trying to, you know, get the double win, he calls it. Win at life and win at work. Yeah, I cannot stand like that rise and grind, work, work, work mentality, the, the whole 5 a.m. club thing. Yeah. Like I get that um, there are seasons in life where you've got to work hard and you're sleeping at the office. I've lived them and I've done them, um, but I don't want it to be the norm. Yeah. Uh, so I do everything I can to set expectations with my family about those busy seasons. Yeah. But then we intentionally schedule time either before or after where we can be together and relax and, and connect. So often the people that do that grind, they sacrifice so much mm -hmm. relationally and health-wise mm -hmm. in, those, in those prime years mm -hmm. that when they get to whatever freedom that they think that they want, mm -hmm. their health is crap. Yeah. And they, they're alone. Yeah. And it's just not, it's just, it doesn't work out. Yeah. Nobody starts a business uh, or becoming an entrepreneur really excited about having crappy health, having no relationships and having no uh, hobbies that they can do because they're so entrenched in their work and, and they don't have any boundaries. Right. Um, again, it, it, it takes a team because of the awesome team of people that I have because of my awesome team that I have at home. Uh, this year, my uh, assistant counted up. 
there has been so far this year, now we're in December, so it's getting towards the end of the year, but um, 67 days, not counting weekends, so weekends on top of that, 67 days that I was out of the office all year. Yet this is the probably the most productive year I've, I've ever had mm. with stewardship and the book launching and the course launch. So mm. uh, when you have a, a team of people who genuinely care, who are on a mission at home and in the office, it's a big deal. So good, dude. Mm. That's so good. Well, um, let's well, one final question. Okay. Unless you think of something else that you want to jump into. Yeah. If you had to scrap it, mm. Stu- stewardship, it you had you had to hand it off, mm. and you had to go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And it's just your family and what you guys can carry on your backs, mm-hmm. and you're starting again. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think that you would do? Mm. Would you rebuild the same thing in a different place? Would you do something totally different? Would you what 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 would be the the inspiration? What do you think that you might want to do or try or experiment with? Yeah, I would definitely say we'd still stay in Arizona. <laughs> we love that. You love the state. Oh, we love the state. I love my home. Mm. I love the warmth. Um, but I think I would just evaluate to see maybe what I could do even more with my kids and with my wife. Um see how we can involve them more with it. Because when stewardship was started, they weren't, you know, the, the vision of stewardship started before I met my wife. Yeah. Um, stewardship was an actual entity and we were serving people in our community before my kids were, were born. Yeah. Um, but I would, I would get with them and I'd ask this question, what are needs in the community that you see? Mm. What are needs and how can we fill it? Because that's, that's business, serving people and genuinely filling their needs and finding unique ways to fill them, yeah. and putting their needs ahead of our own. So... I think that's probably the only thing I'd do different. It's awesome, dude. The book is called The Problem Isn't Their Paycheck. Yep. You can go to Amazon and search that, or you can just search my name, Grant Botma, and it'll come up. Grant Botma mm-hmm. and social media. Yeah. So you can uh, follow me on Instagram. That's probably where I'm most active, at Grant Botma. So I'll do, um, not even only while I post every day, but I also do an Instagram story almost every day Good for where you. I'm talking about like um, uh, personal finance stuff. So we'll talk about home loans, insurance, or investments, or whatever. Uh, but I'm also going to be talking about company culture, or leadership, or sometimes mm. stuff with family or whatever. But yeah, almost every day you'll you'll get something. Love it, man. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a privilege. Thanks oh, for being here. Yeah. So good to get to know you. Thanks for serving the Spirit Farm community. Oh man. Uh, I'm going to pick up that book, read that book. Hopefully, a lot more people will follow mm. you on Instagram mm-hmm. and uh, watch this journey. It's a good one, and I appreciate all the wisdom, the nuggets, the inspiration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you're you're a good dude doing great things. Oh, thank you. And and I you didn't expect me to say this, but I'm going to. I because the book thing and the virtual tour, I'm being interviewed a lot. Uh, but I just want to say you're really good at this. Mm, this has been fun. Uh, a very very easy conversation to have. Yeah. Um, and I'm grateful for the way not only the setup that you've created and how beautiful this is, uh, but the environment where which you ask questions. Um, I don't know you well, but I feel like I know you a whole lot better by the way that you ask the questions. So I appreciate your genuine heart. I'm grateful for you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Grant. Yeah.